Ah, you God chasers. You guys are something else. So you'll see a lot of red shirts today. We're going to be cooking some shrimp on the bobby eh? because we're celebrating the start of our VBS tomorrow night, 6 o'clock, 6.30, I think it is. But if you get here at 6, you'll get a good seat. Everything's going to be in the Family Life Center, so don't go to the church. Everybody online, do not go to the church. It's going to be locked. Everything's going to be in the Family Life Center or in this room, so that means our next Sunday school, everybody's going to have to help. Re- no, I'm just kidding, but we'll probably have some glitter and stuff in here and that, but it's great. It's going to be a great vacation Bible school. I'm really excited about it, and uh, if this afternoon, if for some reason you can't be here, you know some people actually have to work. If you can't be here every night, you know you definitely want to go over there after church and at least see the backdrop that has been prepared from all the volunteers working so hard on it. It looks fabulous. We got a, I didn't know that they could do it, but we got a Jeep inside the Family Life Center. And we didn't have to tear no doors off or nothing to do it. So praise God. Praise the Lord for small miracles. It's going to be great. It's actually a celebration of the sanctity of life is embedded into the study. And so that's why it says back here, you know, woo. Uh, it's an Australian theme, so I'm in my Australian, look, my Australian boots and my khakis. I got a hat, but I'm not going to spring that on you in Sunday school. I'm gonna do, Come on, I'm going to do that over there. Now, you done let the cat out of the bag. Everybody's going to like seeing me in my hat. Because listen, if you don't know it by now, Crane Eater supports our kids. Amen. They do. And I was tempted to put on my shorts to really look Australian, and then I thought the Holy Spirit spoke. And uh, I've got my long britches on. And, and you'll see shorts. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. It's just that I didn't feel the liberty to do that on the stage. So today, the confusion, dispersion of Babel. Let's pray. Heavenly Father... We thank you for every brother and sister that's here and those that are on the internet. God, we thank you that they take this time out of their days to come together to study the Word of God. Let us learn together from each other, which is what you told us to do, even as iron sharpens iron, and help us to grow together in the love and the grace of Jesus Christ. Help us to show love to our fellow man and help us to reach out to those that don't know you as their Savior and help them to come to Jesus Christ, the only Savior of the world. And we'll praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, who's the door? Jesus is the door. And if anybody will enter by him, he will be saved. And we'll go in and out and find pasture. That makes our farmers happy because it put in there the pasture, right? So, So farmers are close to God. They should be. I I know there's enough prayer going up on a farm to take care of them. You know, I guarantee it. So were the pyramids in Egypt built before the Tower of Babel? No. Wow. You sound pretty sure of yourself. No, we had no, no, no. Anybody think yes? Anybody want to debate with a yes? No, I didn't think so. I had a debate with never really thought about it. Never thought about that before. See, so I'm glad you've already encountered something that promotes the thinking process. It's great. So turn to Genesis chapter 10. We're going to read the Word. Now let me just give you a little background while y'all are going there. Sometimes in the Bible, these are historical contexts. You know, we talked about the types of Scripture that there is. There's poetic Scripture, there's historical context, different things. And sometimes we get to reading something and we think every verse is chronologically in order. And most, many times, many times, not most times, many times, they're not. So what we're going to get into when we start looking at chapter 10 is it's going to start going over the clans and the genealogies. Now many times it does that to help prepare you for what's coming next, not that that is exactly in the order of it. So it's like I would preface something that I might say with an illustration But the illustration is not what I'm getting to. I'm coming to that. That's why it's a preface. And so the the next thing will be uh, 
more importantly, what we will look at. And so when we look at these two chapters, 10 and 11, we're going to flip back and forth and we're going to kind of highlight some of the scriptures and make sure that you understand this genealogy and what's taking place. And uh, <clears throat> I'm going to just start with Genesis 10, 32. These are the clans of the sons of Noah according to their genealogy. So he's telling you this. In their nations, y'all see nations? Say nations. Thank you. And from these nations spread abroad on the earth after the flood. Now the whole earth had one language in the same words. No, no doubt about it. Genesis 11. Now the whole earth had one language in the same words, and as the people migrated from the east, they found in the plain of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks, and let us burn them thoroughly. And they made brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. Now bitumen is a Another word for asphalt. If you think of the La Brea tar pits in California where there were open tar ponds that animals would get caught in and, and they couldn't get out of because it's just like asphalt and in the heat of the day as it dries it becomes hard like asphalt. That was the butamen that they were using for mortar as they went through this. So... It's talking about, and Megan, you're going to have to move with me, so. Uh, yeah, I understand, but I'm going to go over here to the seven seas of history. What we're getting ready to get into big time here, next week is our review week, is the, this sea right here, the fourth one called confusion. And if you have a chance to come look at this, we're in this time frame, 2348, 2281 B.C., and in this, like Martha, or whoever she was. And, yeah, Hannah. Yeah. What did what, you say her name was? Vanna, Vanna. I'm not as... <laughs> the 16 grandsons of Noah. Grandsons of Noah, right? And in some cases, it's great-great-grandsons. But what it's talking about here is all of these, Gomer, Magog, Madai, Javan, Tubal, Meshach, and Tiras, it tells you on here what the modern-day countries those are that came out of these grandkids, right? And these are all Japheth's grandkids, Noah's son, Japheth. Then you have Ham. Ham is Cush, that's the Ethiopians. Egypt, Put, which is present-day Libya. Canaan, which is the Palestinian area of what is called Canaan which is present-day Israel, but in that day and time it was the land of the Philistines, right? And that was Canaan, that area was called Canaan. Not the Canaan, you know, the, well, let me just go on. Then there's uh, Shem's son, these are all Ham, and then there's Shem's sons, Elam, Asher, Arphaxad, Lud, and Aram. And out of Shem's sons, Arphaxad had a son whose name was Eber, E-B-E-R. And if you look at it in the Hebrew, that is where the word, when they started calling people Hebrews, they were referring to Shem's son, Arphaxad, and his son, Eber, right? So this is telling you when this is happening. Eber was born, which comes the name right here in 2281. So they're all together still. Even though the genealogies I just read you makes it sound like that they were other nations, right? Because it talked about them. I made you repeat the word nations. Y'all remember that? Yeah. So that was in chapter 10, but they're not nations yet until we get into chapter 11. Yes, sir. Adam. And then Arphaxad. And then Salem. And then Eden. Right. So it's 11, 12, 13, 14 generations. 14 generations. And then the New Testament talks about 14 generations when it deals with the, the division up to David and after David to the day of the Lord was 14 generations. In chapter 10, 
it gives us these genealogies. If you notice in chapter 10 and verse 20, it talks about languages and their nations. And then in 31 and 31 also, it says the nations spread out from these after the flood. So go to chapter 11 now, and we just went through that. So when he says, when they said, come and let's make bricks, okay? And look in 11.4. And they said, come and let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top's in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest the whole we be dispersed over the face of the earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men had built. When it says they, who... who have you, you know, when you hear people talking to you and they say, well, they said it's not true. And you, first thing you want to well, who's they? Right? We want to know who they is. What? Okay. Well, if you look in Genesis chapter 10 and verse 8, somebody read Genesis 10 and 8 for me. Yeah, just go ahead and read that for me. Verse 10. Verse 10? Yeah, I want you to read it too. Mm -hmm. Verse 10, it's just like two down from eight. His kingdom started with Babylon, Erech, Akid, and Helm, and the land of Sinar. Sinar. Okay, so it says, Cush fathered Nimrod, who began to become powerful. So there's always this one, when there's a they, there's always going to be a leader. There's somebody that is leading and leading the pack. And this individual, by the biblical definition, had become powerful in the land. He had become mighty, a mighty one in the land. And so it even described that he had this whole kingdom, right? So these words are all telling you this isn't just some jackleg down the road. This is a person of some importance and influence and power. So when they came up and said this, let us make bricks and let's burn them and make stone and let us build for ourselves a city and a tower with its top into the heavens, right? That's coming from somebody that is swaying the people. Now, how many people do you think is on the earth at this time? Now, you know, so you, you, I know that's a trick question. I, I, I knew I was going to get those looks, and I have gotten them about that. So let's just back up. Noah, three sons, and then they have grandchildren. When you look in the genealogies, it starts telling you how old they were when one was born, and then it tells you how long they lived after that. For example... Terah was 70 when Abraham was born, and he was uh, lived another 135 years to be 205 years old. That's Abraham's father, Terah, which comes after these grandchildren. He's setting us up, the, the chapter right here in 11, 10 and 11, is setting us up for the real thing that's getting ready to happen in chapter 12, which is God speaking to Abraham. So he's telling you this is occurring during this ice age that we talked about last week. And there, the scriptures are only giving you some of the highlights of the genealogies. If you lived and were able to reproduce children past 150, that would be a lot of names, no matter how you cut and dry. Because my mother had a child in January and another one in December the same year. Yeah, so put that up. You could have been having two a year for 100 years. So, and then when they get to be about 18, 19, they can start having two a year, and the next one's after that two a year. So it wasn't billions of people at this time, but it was a pretty large number of a workforce that could start to do what he's describing in chapter 11, right? And, and so they were one, one language. They came from the east and settled in the land of Shinar, so more than likely they moved from around Mount Ariat, which is toward Turkey, and down into what is present-day Iraq. Now, like a lot of us, when we go on a trip, if we were doing a, a big migration like this, 
And you can see that true throughout the United States. A lot of people, when they got to a really nice valley, like Shenandoah Valley, boom, we're stopping right here. We're not going west. They never got to the Mississippi River. You know, a lot of people, as they migrated, when they found a real nice place of good grass, good trees, good water, they just stopped and stayed. And it's kind of like this. They were moving down, and when they hit this, land, this valley of Shinar, it was great. Nice and flat and had pastures and great water. And they, the, one of the definitions of that Shinar is two rivers. So there were two different rivers of water running, probably the Tigris and Euphrates. And so they stayed. But there's always a leader, right? There's always this leader. And what is it that he said was the purpose of building the city and the tower. And let us make a name for ourselves. A.K.A., y'all know what that means, right? A.K.A. pride. (coughs) Pride. One of those sins that the Lord hates is pride. See, when you want to make a name for yourself, and just in case uh, some of these evangelists today and these organizations are listening to me, which I doubt highly. (laughs) If I was going to start a ministry tomorrow, I would never use Paul Gay's Ministries. Because I don't want my name to be the forefront. I want his name to be the forefront. And so all of these that have their names with their ministries, it's almost like an issue of pride. What I I know, I know there'll be somebody that comes up to me and says, well, wait a minute. Okay, I get all that. You know, Jensen Franklin Ministries, you know, I get all that. What they're really doing is trying to separate their own personal income building apparatus, which is their ministry, from their churches. Many of them don't even take a payroll from the churches no more. They're self-sufficient on their own books and stuff like that, so they do that. But everybody, including all of those kind of ministers, have to be careful about pride. You know, every day... Our pastor, Howard, has to be careful about letting pride enter into his ministry. It's easy to do sometimes if you've got 200 people telling you what a great job you did Sunday. And they tell you that every week. You know, it's easy to slip into that. They wanted to make a name. This man wanted to make a name for himself, and he convinced the rest of them to go along with it. See, that's that herd in mentality. Just go along with me so we can have a name. Why was that a problem? Probably lots of people want to make names for themselves. God comes down. (laughs) God comes down, doesn't he? And he came down to see the city, because they were building the town, and the tower which the man, which the children of men have built. And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they all have one language, and this is only the beginning of what they will do. Boy, was he right. And nothing that they propose to do now will, will now be a excuse me, impossible for them. Come, let us, us. Who's he talking to? Hmm. A trinity. Not, okay, not just one. I mean, otherwise he would have, it would have been kind of silly if it was just God to say, let, come, let me go down. And that wouldn't sound right. He would just go down. He said, let us go down. And there confuse their language so that they may not understand one another's speech. So this word is called Babel. In the Hebrew, it's also Babylon. And Babel sounds like the Hebrew word Balal. And if I ha- and I can't do it, okay... I was teasing my Jewish sister here to this morning about how we pronounce words that are Hebrew into English. It's not a one-for-one translation, okay? So I heard an he- a Hebrew, true Hebrew, a Jewish minister, pronounce Noah, right? We say Noah, right? But it's Noach. No- See how the ach stuff, it's almost like in German where it sounds like you're throwing up. Noach. But that's the way they would have said Noah. But, but if, if I said Noah every time, even if I got good at it, which I'm not, you'd probably look at me kind of weird sometimes and say, who's he talking about? And they say, oh, he's talking about Noah. Right? 
There's differences in the translations. Balal sounded when people started talking like Bible. And, and the word Balal means in the Hebrew to confuse, which is exactly what God was going to do. So, you know, I told you this before. Everybody comes into Sunday school, we're all fat, dumb, and happy. Not all of us are fat, but, well, not all of us are dumb. Okay, everybody's happy. We all come in here happy. And we're all talking and fellowshipping like we do. And all of a sudden, God changes all of our languages. Every last one of us in here. I can't understand a thing that Ken is saying. He goes to get a biscuit. Mandy and them, they just look at him like, what? What do you want? And he's saying her lips moving, and I don't have a clue what she just said. I want a biscuit. What do you want? I want a biscuit. Well, you know, it wouldn't take long for tempers to flare. And that's what was happening here. It doesn't matter if there was a 500, 1,000, or 10,000 people, does it? I, I'm not going to try to tell you what the total population of the Tower of Bible was. It was enough for them to build a city. It was enough for them to build a tower, okay? And they had the skill sets to do it, right? Did they? Ha how do you know they had the skill sets to do this, this tower? How do you know? What? Okay, that's a good one. The Bible says so. I like that, JC. What else? They were doing it. What else? What did their great granddaddy build? An ark that held wild animals for a year and didn't sink. Me and you probably couldn't build a boat today that wouldn't sink in a hundred years. I mean, in a year, right? So they obviously, and they also, it tells us that at the time of Noah, there was those that knew how to work with metal. So they were metallurgists, metal workers. So they obviously had the, the ability, the intellect, and one language to coordinate a massive construction program. You know, we have that problem today uh, when you're in a construction program, don't we, Brother Ricky? So Brother Ricky, a famed construction individual who built his whole career on building things for other people, I can let him get up here and give you some real horror stories about the lack of communication and understanding. So I thought you wanted this kind of cabinet. No, I wanted the lazy Susan kind of cabinet. Well, that's not what you told me. Yes, it is. So we finally got down and said, okay, I'm just going to draw it on a piece of paper. And you look at the plans, and I'll look at the plans, and we'll agree on the plans. And then what do we use the rest of the building process? The plans. The plans. It's very important even today to communicate, even though we're all speaking English, right, how to build something. So you can imagine we're all talking about building the city, building this giant tower, and all of a sudden none of us understand one another. And, and we weren't doing building plans back then. It was just all word of mouth. It was uh, catastrophic for them. So they wanted to make a name for themselves, right? And the Lord wanted to change that. And so the Lord dispersed them. So not only were they prideful, but they were disobedient first. God had told Noah, go, be fruitful, and multiply, and fill the earth. And you, be fruitful and multiply, increase greatly on the earth and multiply in it. He told them multiple times, your job now is to go replenish, go out throughout the earth and set up cities and nations and kingdoms and spread out. But they hit that valley and said, this is good enough. So first they were disobedient. When you sin, your first sin is probably being disobedient to what he's already told you to do when we sin. There's not any new sins. No, Solomon said, oh, there's nothing new under the sun. What has been now has been before. You're not creating some new sin today that nobody's ever thought of in 2,000 years. What we are still being is disobedient to what he's already told us to do. And week after week, 
preachers all over this world get in front of a bunch of people and all they're really trying to do is tell everybody how to be obedient to the commands of God. Amen. You know, we may use all kinds of illustrations and all this goodness, but at the bottom of the, at the end of the day, it's going to be, are you obedient to God? Don't worry about me, the council, the pastor, the church of God, doctrine, whatever. You need to really be worried about, am I being disobedient to God? Are you? See, that's the kind of question I ain't asking for a response there. Thank you. But you have to kind of get to that point. This was disobedient. Because what is it that they said? He, he said, make a name, verse 4, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth, which is exactly what God told them to do. So you see, now today, because some people, not y'all, but some people in this world, they get so enraptured with an individual's oratory skills, their ability to put sentences together, their ability to write books, their ability to be a great orator, their ability to do something, and they get enraptured by the person. And they become followers of the individual instead of followers of God. That's why our class is not called Paul Chasers. Oh, no, no, no. God chasers. If you're going to chase after something, you're going to follow something, it needs to be God. But people, it's so... Why would they do... Why? Why you... I mean, there's not a soul walking on the streets of this nation that cannot say that they don't have access to the Bible. If they say that, they're bold-faced liars. Because every, almost everybody, including six-year-olds, have got phones and all the apps are there and they're free. No excuse for not knowing the Word. Zero, zip, zilch. No excuse. Then why would you just listen to a man or a woman and not check it against the Bible? Why did those people follow, maybe it was Nimrod, that told them to do exactly what God told them not to do. Let's make a name for ourselves and stay right here so that we don't get scattered all over the earth, which is exactly what God wanted them to do. Anybody got an answer for that? Anybody? Any answer? Anybody have any? Yes, ma'am. Give me, give me that. Okay. Okay. We'll take the comment. I don't think nobody was going to answer anyway. Uh, I think a lot of people hear about what they have to do and what they don't have to do all the time, and so they miss the person of God. Mm -hmm. And so whenever it's like everybody everywhere is all the time telling us mm -hmm. like, what to do, what not to do. Right. But whenever we get to know God, mm -hmm. then that's whenever he like starts dealing with that and telling you, like you get to know him. Yeah. Right. So, yeah, it's tough, ain't it? Introduction yeah. Like all the time. Yeah. Good, brother JC. I was just going to say one interpretation that I've heard of why the child of God will happen was God's plan for making different races and different languages is one of the explanations why we have so many of them. Those people, when you look at, I think it's roughly two point eight million, two point yep. five million people at the time of the yep. Bible. Yep. Yep. Yes. Amen. Yes. Good deal. I'm glad you put races in quotation because there's only one race <laughs> since we all came from Noah. So, uh, but but that's a good point. And, and I want to talk to both of them. Go ahead. I'd like to say something about obedience. Okay. Is obedience. Yes. That's what the word says. So. To her point, right, is this, we need to have a relationship with God so that, because everybody wants to say, oh, I got this problem with the do's and the don'ts, the do's and the don'ts, and the do's and the don'ts, and all this kind of stuff. And it's not an issue if you love the person, right? So all of us that have been parents have been blessed to be parents. Did you give your children do's and don'ts, and did you do it out of sheer hatred for that person? 
No. See, it, and, and if, you, if you use that excuse, let me just tell you, you're being immature. Because God ordained do's and don'ts as a way for us to live in a society together. What, what we used to call a civilized society, which now it, you, know, you, you could question the civilized part of it, in which we live today, but it was all do's and don'ts. We have laws that do's and don'ts for the greater good of the mankind, Right? It doesn't mean that because you go 100 miles an hour down the interstate that inherently you're bound for hell and all that kind of stuff. It just means that you're, you're endangering at that speed the lives of other innocent people. And so we have a don't that says you shouldn't do that. You know, and so when people get into that, oh, it's just a bunch of rules and stuff, we got to take them back to Jesus. we got to take them back to their Savior. We got to take them back to the one that died for their sins so they could live with God for all eternity. And that means having a relationship with Jesus Christ, not just checking the box at the altar. That relationship changes us. And as our children grow, they understand at some point it might be 33 before they realize that what mom and dad was doing was really demonstrating their immense love for me to steer me away from these things and toward these things. And we do that sometimes with rules, do's and don'ts. But the relationship has to be there, and they understand that relationship. And you've heard of many of them that don't have relationships with their parents for one reason or another, and many times it causes a lot of grief for that child when that relationship with loving parents is not there. Because it tends to give them this ability to do whatever you feel like is right. And the Bible says that is sin. When men start doing what they think is right instead of what God says is right, it's sin. We're not smarter than God. No individual is. But it started with disobedience. And it probably had a leader like Nimrod who was very powerful, very swaying. And you think, well, this is the modern times. What? Don't forget what happened in Central America at the Jones campus. If you think intelligent, even congressmen of the United States could not be bullwinkled into going down there and going to a campus where the leader would convince everyone to poison their children and then themselves then you haven't read up on the current state of events in the world because that's real reality of what people can sway others to do. That's the reality of it. So he devises their language. Let me get on to this. So this is an artist's rendition of the Tower of Babel. You know how you know that's not exactly it? We don't know. It hasn't never been found by any archaeologist, okay? And in this depiction, it makes it look like stone. It could have been more wood than stone. You can build one with wood-like cross ties and backfill it, right? And the whole thing could be wood. And over hundreds of years, it would, because they had to desert it, right? Nobody got to stay there. They all couldn't stay there and talk. But throughout the world... There are other structures. This is Chichen Itza in Mexico. We've had the privilege to be there. Many of you have. And it's that same kind of concept. And almost all of these were used in some kind of acts of uh, either intellect, uh, trying to study astronomy, the different times of the uh, solstices that take place Astronomically, astro, astro, yeah, that way. <laughs> or worship of some kind of deity that they had. Look in Genesis chapter 2, verse 24 and 25. And I want to point this out because even, and I told my brother this morning, even I had uh, been a little confused about this in my early Christianity. Our facts had father Shelah and Shelah fathered Eber to Eber were born two sons. The name of one was Peleg. For in his days the earth was divided and his brother's name was Joktan. So for many, many years, including Finnis Dake, believed that that was when the continents of the earth divided was in the days of Peleg. Peleg, some 
theologians believe may have been, at the time this was given, around five years old at this time. But, you know, remember what I told you last week about the Great Ice Age, right? And the, when the flood occurred, it was on a scale that we can't comprehend. In any of you that were, uh, I'm sure you were here, and, and you remember the TV broadcast from Mount St. Helens, which was nothing compared to what happened when God opened the fissures of the earth. And as many theologians believe now, if this had really been the separating of the continents, what we know as the tectonic plates, then it would have been catastrophic. I mean, these fissures would have been opening up in the oceans, just like it did when God flooded the earth, and lava would be pouring out of them, there would be explosions, volcanoes would be going off all over the world. And yet, in the context of not only the biblical writings or any other writings of that time that they go back and look at, there's no description of the days of Peleg of a catastrophic worldwide type event of the separating of the nations. So when you look at the Hebrew and you go back to the original transliterations of the Hebrew, the word earth can mean, in a paraphrase, the people of the earth. Now today we would say it something like this, everyone on earth, right? So we throw the earth in there, but my point is not the physical ball of earth, is it? It's the people on it. Everyone on the earth did X, Y, or Z. So in many cases, that term can be paraphrased just to mean the people. In the Hebrew, for the word divide, it can be applied not just in those terms, but in Psalms 55 and 9, it says, Destroy, O Lord, and divide their tongues. And then in the CSB, it reads, Lord, confuse and confound their speech. So you see, it's using that same word differently in the CSB for the dividing as if it's really not the nations, okay? Now, can we prove that either way? Probably not. Uh, other than just saying, when we study the Scriptures, I was pointing out to my sister this morning uh, in a different conversation about Adam and Eve, many times when you're trying to decipher something in the Old Testament, one of the good things to do, what, what I've learned through all this Answers in Genesis to do, is go back to the New Testament and see if Jesus talked about any of that himself. So if I believe in the translations of the New Testament, which I do because it's encapsulated in God's Word and it's an errant and has no errors in it, then if Jesus said it was Adam and Eve, then you can come up with any other names you want to, but I'm going to always go back to Adam and Eve because I think Jesus is perfect and I don't think he would have mispronounced her name or his name. So you go to the New Testament and you find where Jesus is talking about these same type of events. And, it, and in my book, it leads credence to the understanding of the Old Testament based on what Jesus said about it in the New Testament or any of the other writers of the New Testament as well, whether that's Paul or Peter or James or Jude or any of those. The New Testament, the Scriptures will not be in disharmony because God's Word is perfect. What is in disharmony many times is Paul's feeble mental processes trying to make reason of this. And many times, as my lovely wife of 47 years will tell me, you're just overthinking this a little bit. You know, because sometimes I get hung up in some details that aren't really, in the grand scheme of God's plan, not that important. You know, and miss, miss some of the main points that, that she readily grasps hold of in faith and just, she just grabs hold of it in faith and moves on. And I'm still back there, I don't understand this. I don't know, you know, she's over there happy, go lucky, making coffee, and I'm sitting over here like this trying to make head and her tails out of something. Well, in the context that we were talking about, it was the name of Eve. So I'm just using that as an example that I don't... I, don't, I can't recall right off the head if Jesus talked about the Tower of Babel. But... But because I believe the whole Bible, rightly divided, understanding the word of truth, and studying to show myself approved, a workman that needs not to be ashamed of the word of God, 
dividing it correctly, understanding it as best I can, researching it when I don't understand clearly what the Bible is telling me. I believe the Bible is inerrant. I believe, and you know, if you go, oh, by the way, did y'all see my flowers? Thank you, my sister Sharon, for some roses for my birthday. Thank you. When you look at secularists, they have a real problem. And I don't know what they call these people. they got a fancy scientific name for people that study languages. They have a real problem trying to figure out exactly how all these names, nation, uh, dialects came to be. They really have a problem with that. Now, you know there's a lot of them that are similar, right? But they're sitting, and, and here's what I would say. When they talk about it, they say, okay, well, you know, the Italian, some Italian words sound just like Spanish words from Spain. And some of those words sound just like words in Mexico. And some of those words are just like words in Peru. And, and you go do all this connecting. And I would say, well, imagine that. You know, they all spoke one language in the beginning. And then when God dispersed them, I don't think it's surprising that some of those that sounded a little Spanish, just go with me on this. You know, I can't prove any of we got to go. But if it kind of sounded like Spanish... I probably just went with those guys, right? Because that's kind of what, what I heard coming out of my mouth sounded a lot like what was coming out of J.C.'s mouth. But J.C.'s was Italian and mine was Spanish. But I went with him anyway because that was the closest thing I had. You were speaking German, you know, which I don't even understand at all. Or Swedish or Finnish or all these other different languages. The Tower of Babel occurred. And was it God's plan from the beginning? Well, nothing's hidden from God, Right? And I would say that you have free will. And my God's smart enough. You know, it's kind of like you get to go choose the carpet, right, that you want in your house. And, and that's your free will to do so, right? And then a smart person like Ricky, he knows that there's lots of different kinds of carpet. And so I'm going to ask you to be more specific about your carpet. And so God can have plans in which you have free will. And if you choose this, He's got plans for that. And if you choose this, he's got plans for that. And if Peleg did that, he's got plans for it. And yeah, if he said, if they're all going to get together and do this, I've got a plan for that. And it was real simple. James talks about the unruly member that's in your mouth, full of deadly poison. You know, isn't it amazing that the Holy Spirit, when he baptizes, changes our tongue? That's what God did in the Tower of Babel. He didn't have to change skin colors and do all that. It's not biblical, right? But he did change their tongue and how they spoke. Amen. Hope you all got something from the lesson today. God bless you. Thank you. You're